Welcome to another conversation across generations. Today we are joined by my pastor, the Reverend Clinton McFarland of the Mount Pleasant Baptist Church. Thank you, Pastor, for joining us. Thank you. And we certainly look forward to having a fruitful conversation. Good afternoon to you, Pastor. Good afternoon to you. Thank you again for agreeing to do this, sir. I am more than happy to be involved in this. I think it's quite an honor to have been asked to do this. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Absolutely. The first question we want to get into is, uh, who were some of your biggest preaching models and influences when you were coming up? Well, first of all, my father, uh, who uh, was a premier preacher in our area. Uh, growing up in the rural, he was a premier, profound uh, preacher, and he influenced me greatly. Uh, then I just come from a preaching family. My brother, my oldest brother, my uncle, and then I have another brother preaching. Uh, growing up, I was a fan of preachers. Uh, I remember many of the guys my age in their teens and what have you, uh, they loved Michael Jackson and Prince and all of that, and of course I liked them too, but I was always a fan of preachers. I would get uh, cassette tapes from my daddy of the late Dr. C.L. Franklin, Reverend Jasper Williams, and guys uh, like that, uh, and just listen to them and just learn their sermons even before I ever accepted uh, my call into the ministry. Just love preaching. I always hung out in the office with the preachers. When I would go to church, I would be back in the office with the preachers, you know. And I just, I just love that. And then, of course, once I accepted my call into the gospel ministry around uh, the age of 23, my dad influenced me greatly. He was certainly the best teacher one could ask for. And then I sort of moved from my father to the Reverend Dr. Jasper Williams, who, in my opinion, uh, made preaching a science. You know, even Hoopology uh, and his approach to the text and uh, how he could just tell a story. I was always in awe of uh, Dr. Jasper Williams and then from Jasper to Dr. Donald Parson who uh, I, I'm telling you I was just uh, uh, just really amazed by his vocabulary uh, his ability to see things in the text uh, that the normal person could not see and then could extract it and then expound upon that uh, and then there were many others, but those three guys particularly, and of course the late Dr. C.L. Franklin, so I would say about four guys particularly uh, influenced me greatly, and I took a little bit from all of them uh, and sort of used uh, uh, what I could use uh, until I became who I am and developed uh, what I do. Okay. And with the collaboration of your father and uh, Pastor Carson and Jasper Williams and uh, even Reverend Franklin, mm -hmm. at what point do you think you found Clinton McFarland's voice? Well, I, I think I had been preaching about three years uh, and pastoring. Uh, the fact is, once I uh, accepted my call into the gospel ministry, uh, five months later I was the pastor of a small country <laughs> church. And uh, what's the best thing I think that uh, happened to me? But it took me about three years to find myself, you know. Uh, one thing about young preachers and pastors is that, you know, we see guys we like, we try to emulate what they're doing, and uh, we go through that stage for a while. So one while I sound, I, I would sound just like Jasper Williams, you know, doing all of that stuff. <laughs> And then, uh, then Donald Parson, you know, sound like Donald for a while, and C.L. Franklin, and then inevitably my father. Uh, but it took me about three years to find my preacher's voice, uh, and not just the who, but I'm talking about my approach to dealing with the text. Uh, I, I believe that I am a scriptural, scriptural preacher. I, my, the objective for me is to always make sure that they know the scripture, they know the text. So I want them to know the story and, uh, you know, get a, just a little portion of the text and expound uh, upon that text. And I think, I think it took me about three years to get to that point. 
because I don't consider preaching to just be tuning and hooping. Of course, that's what we do in the black Baptist tradition, and I love it. But then I think that what makes the preacher total and complete is how he looks at the text, and he's able to find his approach to dealing with the text. You were speaking about younger preachers earlier in your answer. Can you talk about some of the opportunities and even the threats you think that my generation of preachers may come across as we get older? Well, number one, let's talk about the opportunities. There are many opportunities that the young preacher is afforded by way of the Internet, computers, and all of that. I had been preaching about six or seven years before I got a personal home computer and still did not have the Internet. But young preachers have a great opportunity today because you can go online and get a variety of material, teaching, preaching, different preaching styles. You've got YouTube. You've got oneplace.com. You have sermoncentral.com, and then you can Google whatever thought or ideal you want, and you can really draw from a well of resources. So the young preacher has a greater opportunity than maybe when I started or my father started because we would have to dig into commentaries and books, and you had to do a lot more work in order to prepare a message. And so I see a lot of young preachers who do take advantage of these opportunities, and I think young preachers, I've seen some good young preachers who are more advanced than I was at their age, 25, 26 years old. I think the problem that young preachers will face is that preaching has become more popular by way of television, and so most guys want to be popular. They want to be on YouTube where they're getting the hits and do the television thing, and certainly I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I think, though, sometimes we put the cart before the horse. Now, I know you may not understand that, but growing up in a little place called Shibuta, Mississippi, we still understood what horses and carts mean. So the problem with that is that young preachers sometimes will think that the essence of preaching is to have a hoop and a suit, and so we get a custom-made suit, we get a good little tune to what we do, and we neglect the meat of the message. And you can make gravy with any kind of meat, but if you want good gravy, then you need a good, solid meat. And so I would encourage every young preacher, you know, nothing wrong with the nice suit, nothing wrong with getting the nice car, nothing wrong with having a nice hoop, but the bottom line is that we have to minister to the people. They need to know what the Word says. They need to learn the Scripture, because the average person in church, they don't read the Bible. And it's incumbent now upon those of us who are preachers, who stand before the congregation Sunday after Sunday, night after night, to make sure that when they leave, they leave with more than just a good feeling, but they leave with some knowledge. They leave with certainly inspiration, but also information. And so I don't want that to become a peril or a problem for the young preacher to just, you know, engage the celebration of preaching without embracing and engaging the crux of Christianity, the foundation of our faith, and the meat of the Word. You were speaking of how a lot of young preachers want us to be popular. Of course, you know, you are Clinton McFarland, you're a very popular guy, you do revivals all over the country. Can you speak to the ups and even the downs of pastoring and being a revivalist? Well, there are ups and downs to it. I can certainly say that. 
I don't know so much about the popularity, but thank you for that. I just like doing what I'm doing. I love this gospel. I love this business of preaching. And I just always try to do it to the best of my ability. Pastoring and preaching, and particularly one who travels as much as I do, it can be difficult at times. One of the things that I have learned to do as a preacher, pastor, evangelist, lecturer, or what have you, is to prioritize. Earlier in my ministry, I was just so wanting to travel and, you know, you enjoy going to preach for the Jasper Williams and the Frank Rays and the Donald Parsons and, you know, all of that is an honor. And I still like doing that. But now I have learned to prioritize. And I would suggest to that preacher who is a pastor, but then he is a popular preacher, which means that people are calling him to come and conduct revivals and other services and things of that nature. Make sure that your priorities are straight. It took me a while to learn this. And I regret some of the things that I did earlier in my ministry, like being gone a lot on Sundays, missing Bible classes, giving other persons and other preachers the responsibility to teach and preach in my absence. And, of course, I think the preacher has to take some time away from it, but I think I did too much of that in my earlier ministry. Now I have learned. You know, you learn better, you do better, and you mature. Now I have learned, and as you know, you are a member of the Mount Pleasant Church. I'm there every Sunday. I preach most every service. Monday night at my Lithonia location, I'm teaching Bible class. Tuesday noon in Atlanta, I'm teaching Bible class. Tuesday night, I'm teaching Bible class. I'm there on Sundays. I'm there for the funerals. I'm at my church for the weddings. I try to make sure that I do what a pastor is supposed to do. Now, in my free time or the time where I don't have those obligations, then, yeah, I will catch a flight and I'll go preach for a guy in Houston or in New York or, or California or what have you. And sometimes I may leave on a Sunday evening after church, fly to California and preach for somebody, and I'm right back in town on Monday getting ready for my Bible class. So what I call that is that's prioritizing. And one of the things we have to learn as pastor preacher, particularly when people are calling us to do it as much as I do, just make sure you don't put the cart before the horse. Uh, make sure that you prioritize and, and, and keep your pers perspective straight as it relates to your assignment. God called me to Mount Pleasant. Yes, sir. This is my, this is my assignment. And I don't want to be guilty of taking care of everybody else's church, blessing other churches, and my people right here at Mount Pleasant are suffering uh, because I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do. Yes, sir. I've learned that. And so with, with traveling, with pastoring, with weddings, with funerals, uh, with all of that, where is there time to prepare for a Sunday sermon? <laughs> well, thank God that I have access to computers and internet and all of that uh, as well. So uh, one of the things that's been a blessing to me is that uh, when I'm on a plane, and, and I fly a lot, so I'm on the plane all the time, and my cell phone won't work, so can't nobody call me. Uh, you can get internet and through Wi-Fi and all of that on the plane, but normally I don't connect to it. It gives me the opportunity to really read and study. Uh, if it's an hour flight, if it's a two-hour flight, I'm taking all of that time. I'm on my computer, uh, and I'm working on that message. I'm doing my research. And then, of course, when I get to a city, let's say if I leave on Wednesday, and I'm in Miami, Florida, uh, Wednesday and Thursday night. Well, I get there on a Wednesday evening, preach that night. All day Thursday, I'm in my room working and preparing my message. But now, one of the things that I do is I start praying 
prior to that week about what God wants me to talk about. So that Sunday night, when I finished preaching at Mount Pleasant, on Sunday night, I'm already reading my scriptures. I'm already looking at research so that it can be in my mind all week. But now remember, I have to teach Bible classes on Monday and Tuesday noon and Tuesday night. So I'm always looking at something. Every free minute that I get, I'm looking at something because I understand you must be prepared. I try to make sure that I'm always prepared when it's time to stand before God's people. So I just take advantage. If I'm in the truck or in my car and I'm headed to my office, it takes me 35 minutes to drive, I may have a teaching CD on or I may have the Bible on my cell phone hooked to my stereo in my, in my vehicle and I'm listening to that. And there is no excuse to not be prepared when you stand before God's people. The president of the past president of the National Baptist Convention, Dr. William Shaw, uh, made this statement. He said, for a preacher to be ignorant nowadays ought to be a crime. <laughs> he ought to go to prison. He ought to go to jail because there is no excuse. We have too many resources available to us uh, that we can glean from and draw from for us to be ignorant standing before God's people uh, nowadays. Yes, sir. Um, well, for those of us who just recently encountered Clinton a problem a few years ago, and we see that, you know, you pastor here in Lithonia, you pastor here in you know, one church ministering in two communities. How did pastoring that little country church at the age of 23 uh, in rural Mississippi prepare you for the journey at hand here in Atlanta, Georgia, pastoring in two different communities? Well, I thank God for my humble beginnings, and it was. But I want to tell you this, Adam, it was the best church, and God knows I love Mount Pleasant, and those of who, uh, those who have followed me for years know that I had a great ministry in Columbus, Mississippi, at the Southside Church, and I love both of these churches all with all my heart. But I still have to say that... <laughs> The best church I've ever passed uh, was that little country church in a little place called Petula, Mississippi, the John the Baptist Church. They gave me my star. They were patient with me. Uh, my daddy gave me some advice when I uh, accepted that church. He said, son, you've never passed it before. Uh, in essence, you do not know what you're doing. So I would suggest to you that you take a few years and just preach and get to know the people and do what you need to do uh, in that way. So I did that probably two, two and a half years. I made no changes. I just preached. I kissed the babies. I gave the brothers dap. I hugged the sisters. Loved the people. Preached the house down to the best of my little <laughs> ability. But they were so patient with me. And I'm the preacher, pastor that I am today and don't claim to be much. But what little bit I'm able to do today, I can attribute that to the John the Baptist Church in Petula, Mississippi. Uh, they gave me my start and they developed me. I stayed there for seven years, seven and a half years. And they really uh, gave me a great uh, start. It was a great springboard to what I'm doing now. And uh, uh, I just thank God for that awesome, awesome opportunity. I want to say to preachers, don't uh, fret over over humble beginnings. Okay. Had God given me Mount Pleasant then, I would have ruined it. I would have messed it all up. I could not have handled Mount Pleasant uh, then. Uh, but I was able to handle that 75, 80 people that God sent me to, and it never and during my uh, time and during my pastorate it never got above 125 people. Now, the guy who has succeeded me, the church is packed. I mean, they had to extend the church. So he's doing great. Uh, but I never got it above 125 people. But that was a humble beginning for me. Uh, for me, now I passed the thousands of people. But uh, 
Had God sent me to Mount Pleasant then, I would not have been able to handle it. So uh, I thank God for giving me my start through that small rural co uh, community. We thank you again, Pastor, for joining us this afternoon. And we've just completed a segment of Conversation Across Generations with Pastor Clinton McFarland, here the pastor of Mount Pleasant Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia. Thank you again, sir. Thank you. you it's been, been my pleasure.